All right, once upon a time, there was a monkey. How many know what a monkey is? Okay. And what do monkeys like? They like bananas, don't they? That's the talk. Good afternoon. <laughs> This monkey woke up in one morning with a horrible craving for a banana. Ooh, he loved bananas. <sighs> so he ran out of his treetop, ran on down the tree, went zipping down the road toward the banana grove. And while he was racing down, only one, his eyes were practically closed. Oh, banana, banana, banana. Yeah. <laughs> and on the way, he met some of his monkey friends who were right along the trail and the monkey friends said, hold there, banana lover, hold up a minute. Do you know that in front of the trail where you're racing to toward the banana grove, there's a huge elephant blocking the path to the banana grove. And friend monkey, who loves the banana so well this morning, if you don't stop, you're going to crash into that elephant. Remember now, there's an elephant in the middle of the path on the way to the banana grove. The monkey said, elephant, smell elephants, I want a banana. He went, <laughs> <laughs> racing on down the path. Oh, he said, banana, 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 banana. <laughs> Crash right into the side of the big gray elephant. Crashed into the side, clung there for a minute, collapsed, dust all over the... Stunned in pain. He looked around, dazed. Go around the elephant. Get his senses came back again. Banana, 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 banana. And his pace picked up. Zip on down toward the banana grove again. There are some more friends down there. Oh, little friend who loves banana, we have some news for you. Blocking the path of the banana grove is a big, enormous rhinoceros. Be careful of the rhinoceros blocking the path. And he said, Rhino Schmino. <laughs> and went zipping on down the path. Crash into the side of the rhino. Collapsed to the ground. Days. I don't know what's happening to me, but I do know what I want. I want a banana. <laughs> Zip around the rhino. Zip on down toward the banana girl. Banana, banana, banana. Friends called, hey, banana lover, we have some news for you that might save you some trouble if you'll just listen a little bit. There's a big hippopotamus blocking the path on the way to the banana grove. He said, hippo schmippo. And my, <laughs> you're waiting for that one, weren't you? <laughs> Ran on down, smack into the side of the hippo, collapsed on the ground, dazed, and got up. And when he got the banana grove, he was all weary and, and tired. And his mind even changed about the banana because he was so dazed by it all for a little bit. And then the old pressure, pressurized thoughts and feelings, banana, 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 banana. Point. Point. How many love bananas, first of all? How many love bananas? Yeah, okay. How many are indifferent to bananas? How many have psychopathic dislike for bananas? <laughs> We've got you all now. See the point of the story? No, I'll have to tell you because there's too many there. We don't see the obvious. The monkey was told there's a huge gray elephant in your path and if you're not careful to avoid it, you're going to crash into the elephant. Do you think he saw the elephant? Not with the banana dominating his mind. All I wanted, but he can't see the elephant. He didn't see the rhino. He didn't see the hippo. And he got his head hurt, didn't he? And he lay there aching. We ache because we don't see the hippos and the elephants and the rhinos. And we don't see them because we don't want to see them. The reason we don't want to see them because we have a banana-obsessed brain. All we know is what we want. And it never occurs to us that there's a connection between smashing into the elephant, falling down on the ground, groaning with aching bones. It never occurs to us that there might be a connection between what we crave, what we demand, and the fact that we're suddenly shocked and in pain. We can't see the connection between what we want and the results of what we want. 
We don't see what's in front of us because we're completely obsessed. Now that's one illustration. I want to tell you another one. There was a husband and wife lived in a nice, modest little home, had a nice, modest little income, and they had a nice, modest little life. And they, they were good to each other. They enjoyed each other's company. And there's nothing outstanding about them, just what you call ordinary people. And they worked, and they played, and they just average human beings, a married couple. And both of them belonged to several clubs and organizations, both of them. Social clubs, business clubs, religious organizations, churches. Both of them belong to half a dozen or more. But all of them, both of them didn't belong to all the clubs of the other. So on certain nights, the husband, for example, would go out to one of his club meetings and the wife would stay home and, or vice versa. So one night, uh, it's time for the husband to go out to one of his organizations, one of the meetings. So he kissed his wife on the forehead and said, goodbye, dear, see you in two or three hours. And she said, goodbye, have a good time. I'll have a little snack for us when you get back. He said, fine, very good, bye-bye. And drove off, went to his club meeting. Two or three hours later, came back, car pulled in the driveway, got out of the car, went in the house, and the wife was there. Hi, have a good time? Yeah, well, all right. She said, oh, I, I've been spending the, most of the time fixing a nice little snack for us, your favorite, favorite dessert. He said, fine, fine, thank you. So let's go out in the kitchen. So they went out in the kitchen, they set up the coffee and the snack, and he sat at one end of the table, short little table, and she sat on the other side of it. And she poured the coffee and served the dessert. And they talked back and forth a little bit, but. Suddenly the wife looked up at her husband and she said, uh, what's wrong? He said, oh, no, nothing wrong, huh? nothing. She said, oh, come on now. Uh, we lived it together long enough. I know you when you're in a mood, a different state. What's the matter? Something happened at the meeting or problem of some kind, a headache? Can I get you an aspirin? He said, no, 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 nothing, nothing physically wrong. So he continued to sort of just stare at his coffee and his dessert instead of eating it. And she knew better than to press him because she understood that he couldn't talk about whatever it was that was on his mind. So that was the end of that incident. And a couple weeks later, came time for another one of his clubs. She, in the meantime, had gone to one or two of hers at night. But came time for him to go to a, a different club. So he went. Good night. Yeah, see you a little bit. She said, fine, more snacks when you get home. He said, ah, that's nice. So he went to the meeting, came back, out in the kitchen again. Same thing, he, he wasn't his usual talkative self, and she knew it. She understood that something was preying on his mind. So she asked him about it again, think, wondering whether he would loosen up this time. But he, he couldn't seem to, explain. He couldn't seem to speak. He seemed frozen as to what was going on inside him. So she didn't say anything. Third time it happened. He went out to a meeting, came back, sat out in the kitchen. And she said, look, look, something bothering you? Tell me about it. That's what part of what marriage is all about. We talk to each other, talk things over and try to help each other. You know that we try to help each other wherever we can. And just then his attitude just changed just a little bit. And he said, look, uh, dear, I, I don't even know how to talk to you, but since you keep asking me, I, I'll, I'll try. And he said, there's something wrong with these meetings I've been going to. Don't ask me to explain, but the last several meetings I've gone to, when I came out of there, and also when I was right in the middle of that meeting, I had a, a very definite but very vague feeling that something 
wrong was going on. Don't ask me any more than that because I, I don't know. So she didn't press him anymore and time went on again, another two or three months. And every time he came home, the same thing happened. He would seem depressed or quizzical, kind of a blank look on his face, pondering something that he didn't understand. So one night, she said to him, you remember what you said uh, a couple months ago that you've been going to these meetings and you sense that something wasn't right, but it, you can't articulate, you can't explain it? He said, yes. He seemed very glad that she'd brought up the subject. She said, well, you know, I've gone to about four or five of my club meetings, organizational meetings, and when you mentioned the vague disturbance about them that you had, I began watching what happened to me when I went to the, my meetings. And it was so vague, so faint at first, I didn't want to say anything to you. But do you know, I feel exactly the same thing you did, that there's something wrong down at that woman's club I went to, and down under that other political organization where I attended a, a rally. And his, his ears picked up, and he leaned forward across the table. And they, they were both vitally interested in discussing it, but they didn't know how to say what they wanted to say. They were blocked inside. What they were feeling was not matched by their ability to talk clearly about it. But they tried. Every time one of them would come home from one of their meetings, they'd sit out in the kitchen with a little snack and talk about it. And the dominating theme was, there's something wrong, but we just don't know what it is. And I said, look, why do we go to these in the first place? Well, we go to these various organizations meetings because we get something out of it. For example, the labor union helps us to get higher wages. In that political club, we hear about candidates and we choose the one we want and we vote for them. <coughs> why do we go to them? Well, we get, get something out of them, but that uh, business of getting something now seems secondary because something very disturbing has now come over both of us. They did the best they could to understand the feeling. A year later, it took a whole year of both of them trying to analyze what was going on inside of them. Finally, one night, after a year, husband came home from one of his meetings and he sat down across the table in the kitchen and his wife looked over at him and she knew that something had happened internally to her husband. She knew that some kind of a change had come over him since the time he left the house and came back to the kitchen. She didn't know what it was, but she could just tell that there was a certain solemn look on his face as if he had gone undergone a certain experience that was definite and had changed him in some way. So she sat there waiting for him to say something and finally he did. He looked at her and he said, this is the most shocking revelation I've ever had in my life. And I've, I've, for a whole year I've been afraid, dear, to say this to you. I've been afraid even of your reaction to what I'm going to say to you in a few seconds. I've been afraid to hear my own voice saying it. But I'll tell you, I'm going to say it. The time has come and nothing's going to stop me now. The feeling, the feeling is too strong. And she waited. And he, he was blocked a little bit. But he looked at her and he said, you know, and look, whether you understand this or not, dear, I'm going to tell you something that I know for an absolute fact. And here it is. Those people 
down at your club meetings, those people down at my club meetings are our enemies, not our friends. I sense this. I know it. I know it absolutely. And I'll tell you why I know it, how I know it. Since this feeling started coming over me about a year ago, I'd sit back in those meetings and I would watch what was going on. And I even made certain little notes to review when I got home. You saw them as I put them on the table from time to time. I made certain observations of what was happening at those meetings. And let me tell you what I saw. And I, I know I see it. I see it clearly. I know that those clubs and those groups, I know that it's all wrong for them to even exist. And I'll tell you why I know it's wrong. You know I'm not the most virtuous or moralistic man on earth, dear, but I'm going to tell you what I see, and I know absolutely. I know it's wrong to hate anyone. I know it is immoral to put pressure on any other human being in order to get a personal gain from it. I know it's wrong to be vulgar and crude and could you, if you could hear some of the language down at some of those men's meetings we have, and they all laugh as if it's funny. They all laugh as if it's right. And the shock there is this. I was part of it for many, many, many years. Not seeing what was going on, not seeing how evil I was. But because I was, and I, because I was that way, I sought out, joined, attended, encouraged, and paid money to my organizations that were doing the very same thing outwardly and inwardly that I've been doing all my life. Which is to be a pretty cruel human being. I don't know what's beyond that, dear, but I do know this. I am not going to go along with that anymore. I have quit in my mind, and I'll do it officially by a letter or by phone if I have to. I have quit every one of those organizations. I'll never again go to any more because I know, and I'll repeat, dear, what I said before. I know that those people are my enemies. Even if they get me $80 a week more wages, they're still my enemy because I've sensed something different and I, I, I have no idea I really have no idea what started off my my doubts in the first place a year ago and, and I'm astonished at where it has led me and his wife sat back and she listened and she no she nodded with understanding at every point or two that he made because she had done the very same thing. And when he was all through, she said, I've been doing the same thing you have. And I, I know you're right. We'll leave the couple there. But I'll tell you what will happen to them. Two things. One of two things will happen to them. If the spirit that entered into both of them, if the spirit is, continues to be welcomed as the fir husband's first doubt was welcomed, if that is continued to be, they continue to be receptive to it, someday, one day, both of them will be in this room. They may not come here directly, but they're in Dallas, Texas, or they're in Tampa, Florida, they're in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And they're wondering, they're wondering what's beyond their act of cutting out the old life. And if they will stay suspended and not say, well, that, as most people would do, 
if that group of organization is all wrong, maybe another group would be all right. But if they stay suspended and don't say that, and don't fill up the beginning blank space, empty space within them with something wrong, one of them will walk into the library in Minneapolis, or one of them, both of them, in this case, would get something in the mail, something that perhaps Richard has mailed out a couple of days before. They'll get something in the mail, and they'll look at that, and they'll wonder at it, and they'll send away for a book or a tape, maybe. Because the old life, having been weakened to a point when something really new, when the message, when the message is ready, when ready for them, they will get it, and they'll start to change, and they might eventually come here. You remember how we started the talk this morning that people don't see the obvious? You ever belong to any organization at all, or you went to meetings? Did you, did you happen to notice that those meetings had human enemies? Did you notice that it must have an enemy? Who's the enemy? Obvious, someone who's got something they want. The labor union has the enemy of big business. Big business is the enemy of the labor union. The government is in there somewhere. The religion is in there somewhere. Religious doctrine is in there somewhere. In all these years that we went down to those meetings, we never sat back as that husband and wife did and said, question, I wonder if these people are really my friends or are they simply getting me something, a, a raise or an advancement instead of something far, far higher. The point of both stories. We don't see the obvious. We don't see what, was, what is right in front of us. And even now, after hearing this talk this morning, you're going to go out of here still not seeing the obvious. But we're working at it. We're trying. We're going on from where that couple stopped. Hopefully they'll go on. And we're going to make our minds just as clear and as simple as possible in order to actually go on from there. And I want to call a short, um, have a short break, because I'm going to read some things to you that will continue with this, but I don't want to start now and then have to stop in the middle. Do take a short break now and come back in 10 minutes and we'll go on. We don't see the obvious. Now I'm going to simplify the obvious to the point where it cannot possibly be simplified anymore by reading certain things to you. You're going to take some part in this. You can even respond out loud if you want, or at least to yourself. You're going to have to make a decision, lots of decisions here in a minute, between two choices. Here's the question. When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person asleep or awake? Huh? Okay. Well, now, look, not so fast. When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, who has been in nervous anger and hostility here lately? Were you asleep or were you awake? Right. Now, could we put it any simpler? Can you face that and say, Ah, that's what it means to be asleep, to be a nervous anger and hostility. Right to the point. Try to see the obvious. And remember, your old nature doesn't want to see the obvious. All it knows is it wants a banana. Okay? We're going to take time with this now. When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person treacherous or trustworthy? Who are you hanging around with? Who do you consider your friends? Well, you, you had, some of you in this room had better listen to what's going on here now. If you don't, you're going to bump right into the side of that elephant and you're going to wonder how you got smashed. 
because you're not listening what I'm telling you that the truth is obvious only to those who want the truth instead of your sick friends down at that pressure group or wherever else. Okay. When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person degenerating or developing? Degenerating. You know the answer. Is he artificial or natural? Artificial. When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person against God or for God? Against. Is he right or wrong? wrong? Is he chained or free? Chained. In darkness or in light? If you're in darkness, you're going to choose friends who are like you are. You are always hanging around with yourself. Right? right. No wonder you're miserable hanging around with yourself. When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person stupid or intelligent? An enemy or a friend? Who are, you, who are you calling a friend? You had better look around that hall. You had better look around who you have to your house and whose house you visit. And if some of you right in this room don't straighten out, bang you go. You are being warned right now this morning. You are all being warned. I'm not as dumb as you think. You can't win. There's no, there's no way your sickness can win in this room or with me. You're wasting your time. I am warning you and I am telling you you had better see the obvious. When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person cruel or kindly? Disgraceful or admirable? Disgraceful. Take another look at your friends, those that you admire, and I'm telling you they're a disgrace. And your disgraceful nature is, admire, is admiring their disgraceful nature. What a pity. When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person lost or at home? And you're looking to a lost person to tell you how to get home? Ah, see how the stupidity connects there? When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person self-reckless or in self-command? Of course. Oh, I like this next one. Is he sane? Is he, in, is he insane or sane? Insane. Weak or strong? Your weakness is admiring weakness, calling it strength. Just wait till you crash into that elephant and fall flat on the ground. And it's your fault for not listening to what I'm trying to get over to you this morning. When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person sick or healthy? How about the next one? Is he childish or mature? Childish. Obviously. Is he unconscious or conscious? Unconscious. Beware of people who love to quote words that are favorable to their self-images. Is he foolish or wise? How about this next one? When nervous anger and hostility possesses a person, is that person, person worthless or valuable? Worthless. Evil or good? Evil. Hateful or understanding? Evil. Okay. All right. Obvious, right? Hmm? Do you see what you just nodded your heads to? Uh. I doubt it very, very much. You can test yourself to see whether you understand the obvious by what you do when you leave this room. Now, 
And we go on the next phase. If there is anyone in this room who thinks, for example, that a person possessed by nervous anger and hostility thinks that that person is trustworthy instead of treacherous, I want you to raise your hand and explain your reasoning to the rest of us. Is there anyone here, just a minute please, is there anyone here who thinks that a person who is in a state of nervous anger and hostility, if you think that that person is trustworthy, then please raise your hand and explain to the rest of us. All right. Is there anyone in this room who thinks that a person with a lot of hostility in him is developing instead of degenerating? If you think that a hostile person is developing into spiritual maturity, please raise your hand and explain your reasoning to me. Is there anyone in this room who thinks that hatred hostility, nervous aggression, and so on, is the sign of that person being your friend. A person who is hateful, could that person be your friend? If you think so, raise your hand and explain logically that fact. See, you miserable little wretches, when you get trapped, you remain silent. Lost people do, don't, do not know that their so-called friends are also lost. A lost person doesn't call himself lost, he calls himself found. Therefore, he calls his sick lost friends found. Therefore, we're two found people working together with this religious doctrine or whatever, right? Clear? Yeah. Right. All right, is there anyone in this room who thinks that a person who displays hate... I better go back a little bit. You see, all lost people, all hateful people, are very good in repressing their hatred. And it only comes out when under certain circumstances the, the emotion gets so strong that they forget that their face is beginning to be contorted. Right? They forget themselves because they're so, so lost inside they, they can't remember to play the role. They forget the script. So you remember that, uh, for example, anyone in this room might have a lot of hatred in it, but you don't see it because just now there's no challenge to their egotism. Man, we're getting right down to it this morning. Isn't that great? All right. Is there anyone here who thinks that a person with hatred in him, with sneering sarcasm, sarcasm in, in him, is a sane person? Now, if you think that a person with hatred and sarcasm in has a sane mind, please raise your hand and explain your reasoning to me, to the rest of us. Anyone else? Okay. No. Is there anyone here who thinks that a person with aggressive hatred and hostility in him is a mature human being? Or is he childish? If you, think he's, if you think he's mature, raise your hand and explain to the rest of us your reasoning. See, I know what's happening now. You're trapped. Many of you are trapped. Now let's see if you can in, show a spark of intelligence and use this trap that I've deliberately pulled you into to shatter the trap that's squeezing the life out of you. Let's see if you have that intelligence. If you can't see the obvious of sickness in this world first, if you can't see the obviousness, the obvious sickness, maliciousness, lack of intelligence in, in this world. If you can't see that first, then you can't see the truth that wants to make itself obvious to you. The greatest secret ever revealed is this. By thinking in a new way, you can live in a new way, a way filled with quiet power and lasting happiness. Everything you hear in this cassette tape contributes to your new life. Then you will not only know the secret, 
but you will beautifully live the secret of self-newness. All right. You have a movement of fear that originates in you and extends to the outer world. It also turns inward. So you have movement of tension, of anxiety, of uncertainty, of doubt that starts in here, turns backward, at the same time it divides and goes outward. And as long as you have fear of yourself, of the way your mind operates, of how you think, of how you meet the world, as long as you have fear of yourself, you must have fear of the outer world. However, it is much more convenient to your lost state, which does not want to find itself. It is much more convenient for you to look out from yourself at the outer world and say, I am afraid of that. If you were to give your full attention to the inward division, the same fear dividing itself into two expressions. If you were to look inward inside yourself and say, I am afraid of myself, that would bring up too much work for a lazy mind to consider further. Because you know, you sense that if you ever thoroughly investigated the fact that you are afraid of the way you are, you would also detect something you don't want to detect at all, which is your wrecked state, and most horrifying at all of all, is your responsibility for it being there. So now it becomes very easy to refuse to examine the inner fear of ourselves, of the condition we're in. And so much more convenient to extend the fear outward, to express it outward, and say, I am afraid of life. Now that's the generalization, and that's the way you think, that's the way you start. You say to yourself, I am afraid of life. Now, that isn't enough. You start to break it down into a thousand different sections. I am afraid of what life can do against me. I'm afraid that I'll never be adequate to handling the challenges out there. I am afraid that the decisions that have to be made in order to handle even daily events, I'm afraid that the outer world is just too much for me, the way I am. See, see, you haven't said, why don't I see the way I am and see if something comes from that work. You simply blame the outer world and if you fear it, you're also accusing it. Now look what's happened so far. There's nervousness, there's tension, there's horror. Oh, no problem with that. I will just look outward and stay afraid. I will look outward and by doing so, I won't have any responsibility for changing anything in here. If I, can, if I can create and keep going, perpetuate, 
life as the enemy I have nothing more to do it's all settled you know how it's settled you just get up every morning and start the day the same way the same crabbiness the same accusations the same sourness the same stupor the same daydreams and night dreams uh, this is the way you want it nothing to do but drift along on one accusation one fear after another at the enemy life is the enemy that settles it that fixes it that's all I have to do is to know that oh talk about drudgery talk about hard work talk about stupidity my 24 hours of the day all the energy all the force I have all my thoughts all my decisions now have to be brought together in a, in a daily a secondly assault against the enemy in order to keep it going I've just described to you the working of an insane human being of a mind that split right down the middle of a mind that wants to drift through life being as cruel as it wants to be no responsibility no responsibility at all that's it we better develop the theme of insanity a little more wouldn't you agree that a person who spends see nobody's gonna believe this no that's what I'm telling you nobody wants it wouldn't you agree that a person would have to be insane to dedicate every minute of their day to creating an enemy so that they can say I'm afraid therefore there must be something outside of me to make me afraid the very exceptional person the few people who have seen through what I've just described in the last five or six minutes the one exceptional person will notice what I said at the start of the talk that fear divides itself because it's originated by the intellect and it sends out the message and says there's the enemy out there that I must fight I must fight for my rights I must fight to do this or that the person who's beginning to beginning to doubt his life as it is beginning to question the necessity of suffering he will turn his attention to the fact that he himself is afraid of himself as he is now real slow all this time we have said I'm afraid of the economic situation how it can wreck my income and maybe I'll, I'll lose my house or I'm doubtful about whether I'll be able to keep my security with my friends or my clubs or my wife or husband we look out and see these as the enemy but no more if you're going to wake up you're going to find what I've described in the last few minutes that in order to keep yourself in a lazy non-committed and terrible terrible state all you have to do is do nothing
But if you want to do something, then you turn your attention back and you look inside yourself and see where, listen to this, where the only source of the fear of life can exist, which is in me, which is in you. There's only one source of me looking out and being scared at losing you. Losing this. Now, now look carefully, look deeper than that. Why, why do I want to create fears both out there and both in here? Why? All right, I'll tell you why. Because of ignorance. Not just ignorance, of the process itself that we're trapped by but ignorance of our own reluctance our own fear our own fear of letting go of the fear finally if I look hard enough inwardly now and connect it with outwardly I will see that the reason I am mad in both meanings of the word. The reason I am angry, the reason I, I'm such a horror to myself is because I don't understand, I don't understand that it need not be this way. Now, real slow on that one. The native brought up in the dark jungles of Africa with all the the insects and the animals and the poverty and the isolation. That native, that savage brought up with his tribe way back there somewhere. His problem really is one of ignorance. Now I'm using this as an example now. His problem of, is one of ignorance of medicine, of food, of proper shelter, the whole business is one of ignorance. And everyone he lives with, of course, tell him that this is the only way to live, that you have to be sick and the, the animals will get you if you don't watch out, things like that. Now, I will tell you that there is no difference, you understand, there's no difference in the condition of that savage and in the condition of human beings, including the human beings that I'm looking at right now. What keeps the savages right in the heart of the jungle? Well, let's see if we can get the right word for it. A heaviness of spirit that wants to be heavy because then he has no responsibility of getting up on some small hill in the middle of that jungle and looking around and asking what's over the next mountain. Is, is everything like this, the savage asks. He looked down at his village with its poverty and its superstition. Is everything like this See, this is the problem in this class. How can you, and you have to do it, how can you get the incentive to climb to even a very low hill at first and just, just doubt, begin to doubt everything that you have ever been taught about life? Begin to question. Begin to question the necessity for being afraid of anything at all. I said, question the necessity of being afraid of anything. And you could take paper and pencil when you get home tonight. You could, couldn't you? And make a nice long list of everything that you're afraid of. Of everyone that you're afraid of. Of all your own thoughts and feelings 
that you don't even know that you're afraid of because you haven't seen yourself, haven't caught yourself in the act of trembling. Because when you tremble, you close your eyes. And that's your fatal mistake. When you get afraid, now you listen to what I'm saying. For your sake. When you cry, when you're scared, when you're doubtful, you close your eyes and don't even see yourself in the state you're in. I know you don't. I know that you don't want. Listen to this. I know that you don't want to challenge those shakinesses, those tremblings, those fears, those doubts you have inside you. Because you're so infernally lazy. You, you won't take five steps away from that African village. You won't take five steps unless someone offers you an earthly reward for it. Unless someone gives you a promise. They say, you'll be happy if you take these five steps. And you don't know what happiness is. You've never known. And so you take their word for it and you take the five steps. And then because you've committed yourself, because you've paid for it, then you lie. You lie, lie, lie. All of you in this room, every one of you, you lie about everything. And you say, now I'm happy. I took the five steps. I took the course. I read the book. I did some little meditation or something. Now I'm happy. You, you never look at your own face, do you? You never look at the inner, uh, the, uh, the inner expressions that are screaming something that is very contrary to your claim that you have it made. You all say you have it made at least the way you want it. You have it made the way you want it right now. And you say, you just try and budge me out of it. That's not the way it works. You're just looking, aren't you? You're just looking for a savior to come along. Or you'll create your own. You're just looking for someone who acts according to your idea of what kindness is, of what love is, of what help is. You're, ju you're, you're just dying, praying for someone to come along and say, I will help you and you follow absolutely and at 8 o'clock you follow west and at 9 o'clock east and north and south and up and down and sideways you are not going to even understand what's going on in this room you're not going to even begin to glimpse what it means to have a change of your whole nature. And that until you begin to take voluntarily your own steps up, look, you're just asked to climb a low hill at the beginning. Anybody can do that because you can start. Anybody can start where they are. To climb up even that low hill and look down at the village, look at look at the horror of your life. Look at that and then look up over the horizon and say, I wonder. I just wonder whether there might be something else. If you really do it, if you climb that very low hill and look down at the village, which represents your life, and then look at the horizon over there and really honestly say, I wonder whether there's something else you will never, never in your life forget that experience. There's no way to forget it. But you're still not out yet. 
I know you. I know that some of you sense what's going on in here. I know you have I know you have a feeling that this is different, which it is. And yet you live in the same old way all day long. You won't take any responsibility. You won't take any, put any energy to work to go against that thought that takes you over and you go along with it for 30 minutes, for 60 minutes. And not only that, but when you were kidnapped for 60 minutes, you didn't even know you were. Something is going to have to be sterner with you than you are with yourself. Now that's one thing. Someone's going to have to be stronger than you are with yourself. Now that right, that right sternness, that right strength exists. And you fight it all day long. And you fight it by blithely turning your head and lying to yourself again. Well, I'll come back to it tonight when the meeting starts. Or maybe I'll read a book or listen to a tape. You won't confront the enemy, using that word deliberately now. You won't confront the enemy at the moment he makes his appearance. Shall I tell you why? Because you're afraid that you are the enemy and you are, and you are not. What do you think of that? That, that terrible thought comes into your mind, that horrible thought of revenge against someone. Re revenge, striking back, that comes up and you say, that's me. I must not admit it's me, and you turn your head, and you never come face to face with the enemy. Therefore, you never conquer him. He just comes back again. This is exactly what the enemy wants. The devil knows what you're like. He knows how you're going to behave. And he knows how to fool you. He knows how weak you are. He knows how cowardly you are. He knows how easily you get your darling feelings hurt, right? He knows how you have abandoned your life. The enemy knows how you have abandoned your day to him. He's got you. And you know it and I know it. And you can't kid me. Whether you come from now on to every class here or whether you go out of here and never come back to any class again here. I know what's going on inside of you and I know that you are not going to win. Oh, you want to win according to what you call winning which is to turn away from God himself. That's your idea of winning. have any idea of who you're pitted against? Well, of course, imagination, which calls itself a deity unto itself, of course, imagination and conceit and identification, all that is perfectly sure that it can win because isn't it all powerful in itself? You don't think I'm talking about you now, do you? You may suspect it, but you won't face, face it so, so bluntly, come right face to face with it, that you want to collapse from shame at the way you have been. All right. 
if you're not ashamed of the way you treated your wife, your ex-wife, or your ex-husband, if you're not ashamed of the way you treated your brother or sister, your parents, or your friends, if you're not ashamed of, of that, then you try being ashamed of the way you have treated yourself all these years. See, look, look, you have a possibility, and that is what you have treated so shabbily, the possibility of being different. Don't miss this. You have rejected, you have been cruel to the... I wish there were a stronger word than, the word than cruelty. Maybe I'll find one. The way you have been cruel against your possibility for growth, for turning the corner, from going in the opposite direction. What, what utter viciousness, all the viciousness that you have learned, that a vicious society has given to you, you have collected it together, and may heaven help you, you have said, this is the way to treat the offer of God Almighty to save me. To say no thanks, I know better. You miserable little wretches, look at you. And you don't know, you don't know that you have been saying right in front of me for the last 25 minutes, you don't know that you've said, I know better. I'll give you evidence. No, the evidence is as plain as the wall. The evidence that you have rejected the offer, that you insist you know better, the perfect evidence is that after coming to all these classes, you came into this room tonight a scared human being. So I know which way you chose. I know how badly you have treated the opportunity you have for being different. I know that you were, you, you were all waiting for a hero to come along. Where did the hero start? In your own mind. And he's going to be just like you. You are the only hero you have ever had. And to prove it, you have worshipped yourself as the hero. And look at the wretched idol you have worshipped. And look at the results of that right now in this room. You're not weary with it. No, you're not weary with it. There's too much value for you left. And looking out at events out in the world, looking at events in your home, looking at events in your career, your, the way you earn a living, looking at events in your sex life, looking for events in your social life, there's too much value for you in looking at everything that happens to you and then you say to yourself, how can I win? And you don't know that that's an idiot asking the question. There's no way idiocy can win. The only way to win, and you should be somewhat onto this by now. The only way to win is to just give up and not care whether you win or not. Which will put you which will put you through a new a new listen to this. A new kind of hell. A new kind of fear. But you will know you're afraid. You don't know it now. I know it. You don't. Because you're one with it. But that's another story. 
when you can look inside of yourself and not want to face what you see, but do it anyway, you are ceasing, just beginning, to treat truth so shabbily. Ceasing to treat truth so shabbily. You know what appreciation for truth is? It's nothing you have, and it's nothing that I have. You know what love for truth is? It's nothing that I have in my intellect, or you have in your desire, or you have in your verbalization in words. Appreciation and love for truth comes when you vanish. There is no, believe me, there is no lover of truth. If you're a lover of truth, you are a phony, and I, I've spotted you. I'm not going to stay a thousand miles away from you because you're a murderer. Or you're a, you're a religious phony. And you're a very dangerous human being. Excuse me. You're a very dangerous animal. So there's no lover. There's love. There is just love and do you think there can be any hostility do you think there can be any any grief do you think there can be any compulsion to look out at the world and win when there's love hatred wants to win hatred must win Hatred must go out and attack where it can. To behave with violence and no conscience at all as to how it makes other people cry, which is the way the world, almost the whole world is. Aren't you tired of hurting yourself? No. And I will emphasize that. You are not tired of hurting yourself because your pain is a very definite contribution to your self-glorification. One of your key words in your present life is glamour. You want to glamorize yourself. You want to glamorize your thoughts. You want to, your petty, stupid little plans to make an extra $10 today. You glamorize that and become part, remain part of the sickness of this vicious, vicious world. And you are one of the contributors to it. Love is something else. It doesn't want a, it doesn't want a thing. It already has it. How can love be cruel as hatred can be cruel? How can love be cruel when it's not trying to get something for itself? We are cruel, we're vicious only when we say, I need what I think you can give me. And who's the person going to give it to you? Who's going to give it to you? Another human being who is just as sick as you are. And so the little the horrible little game goes on and on and on. If there is one of you in this room who will go all the way, I said all the way, you will understand everything that I've talked about tonight. And your understanding will be in the living of it. And in that, there's, there's a beautiful quietness that never looks around what to see whether people are coming its way or not it has the whole universe all to itself and we'll take a 10 minute break Vernon what's my worst problem and what would be the proper way of going about it say that again John what is my worst problem that I have and 
and what would be the way to go about it? Well, the worst problem any human being has is that he's living in an unconscious state of which he is unaware. Now that is the basic fundamental problem of every human being, including every human being in this room, in front of me. You don't know that you're unconscious when you are. You're unaware of it. Therefore, look, I'm going to talk to some of you. Phyllis, you're unconscious. Lila, you're unconscious. Guy, you're in an unconscious state. Pat, in the back over, row over there, you're unconscious. Al, you're unconscious. Pete, you're unconscious. Larry, you're in an unconscious state. Joe, Bonnie. Does it mean anything to you? Does that mean anything to you? I've tried to, I've tried to get you to connect unconsciousness with pain. Now that's a great clue, a great start. Let's see, he said I'm unconscious and, and it connects with pain. Well, I certainly have pain. So one of the characteristics of being unconscious is pain. How about, how about the hyphenated word self-doubt? How many of you doubt yourselves? You know you do, and I know you do. So John, self-doubt is a characteristic of being unconscious. Can you start with that clue? And what is self-doubt? You can track that down. Start down, uh, track it down by seeing what you call self-assurance, self-confidence. It has no reality at all. That's just a feeling that passes through you because you identify with a favorable event or your own favorable thoughts. Oh boy, just wait till tomorrow morning when I get that new boat. Just wait till tomorrow morning when I'm free of that problem I have. So why not? This is just an idea. And you've connected this with yourself. So you have what you call self-confidence, but it's simply not you at all, and therefore you have to swing over to the opposite. The single greatest problem any human being has is to be under psychic hypnosis and not know that he is and what it, therefore not know what it means. Now I've given you the clue of pain and of self-doubt. Now you have to work a little bit. The only chance any of you in this room has is to come to this room every meeting that you possibly can. This is the only chance you have for understanding what is going on here, which is the revelation of truth itself. You don't know that yet. Some of you new people perhaps don't know that yet. And you never will know it unless you come to every class. If you go out of here and don't come back, you will be lost, but you won't know you're lost. And it'll have no meaning to you. Go ahead, Bruce. This mind doesn't know what to do with the assertion that all of my fear is fear of myself. Because I always thought that even if I couldn't trust things out there, at least I could trust my own mind. Everything that Bruce is, is built on a presumption that I know what I'm thinking about, and that I can figure things out. I don't know where to go with that statement. Again. Yeah, I know. And the only way you can go with it is a deliberate slowing down so that you don't care to fight over it. You fight over it, you're fighting over it because this is one way of concealing yourself in the argument, concealing yourself in the fight. Would you dare to do something different, not just Bruce, but the rest of you? Would you dare to step out of the argument? Have you ever, ever have a kid had a little scrap with someone, you threw something at someone, they threw something at you, maybe you banged away at each other a little bit. Have you, have you noticed how tied you were to the other person? How he became essential to you? How are you going to fight unless there's someone to fight? All right. Now that's the habit system we build up <laughs> physically and inwardly. All right. Can you dare to do without someone to fight? Can you just walk away? I've given you many examples of that. For example, Fear that you won't be able to get this. 
that you won't be able to understand it, that you will die before you grasp it. Do you dare to just walk away from that argument? It is an argument. Am I, am I going to make this? How can I make it? Why, why don't I make it? I must be stupid. Do you dare to just turn around and walk away? You're afraid of death. You're afraid you'll die if you walk away from the argument. And I'll guarantee you, you that you will die if you walk away from the argument. And you will be resurrected after that. Just a minute, please. The mind of itself, the ordinary mind, with, with ordinary thoughts, lives for itself fiercely. And when you identify with that mind, it, you also take it for granted that it's leading you safely and leading you into permanent existence. Can't you see the necessity for creating new fights every minute, new fights every minute, in order to create the illusion that you're continuing? You're continuing in time as a physical self. You're continuing as time as a mind that thinks, but you're not continuing in eternity because eternity isn't connected with time or with the physical body. So much is happening here. So much, so much happens in this room. When, and we'll, we'll increase the tempo of it. We'll all go harder so that those parts of us that want to escape won't have any a chance at all to escape. To run away, I should say. The pressure has to build. Now, what, what does it mean the pressure has to build? The insight into your insanity creates pressure and tension inside of you. Because you see it without knowing what to do with it, see? And you still are under the delusion that you should do something about your insanity, which is a fact. You say, it's a fact that I'm mad. You, you, you watch yourself for just a half hour and you, you see the, the utter recklessness of your thoughts, how you have no logic at all, how you hate a man wa who walks toward you just because the pleasure of hating him. And you see all that. In short, you begin to see your insanity and that builds pressure. Because you, you'll make the mistake, you'll always make the mistake, because you're not far enough along it. You'll make the error of saying, but what should I do about it? And when you ask that, you've just condemned yourself for a, a number of more years of that insanity. Because now you're going, the insane person, which is all you are, one inmate of the insane asylum is going to cure another inmate of the insane asylum, right? And so we, we do this for years and years and years. And, and sometimes, we, we, we have done this many times, have we not? We say, ah, he's cured. I've found God. Or I've found a new excitement. The insanity continues until you see it and don't do a single thing about it. Then it will fade of itself because you have left it in time where it belongs and anything left in time will fade of itself. Have any of you here, in any way at all, seen the fading of a small negativity in you in the really right way? Have you seen a little bit? That's all it's asked of you for now. <clears throat> Betty, please. Uh, your illustration of natives living in the jungle out of sheer ignorance describes my life as I see it now perfectly, where I lived so stupidly for so many years, for all of my life. Yes. All right, Betty, and the rest of you too. Can you see, with your awareness of your insanity, 
can you also be aware, and, you, and it's there, I'm just pointing something out to you, can you be aware of the lessening of the shame that you had just a little bit? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. That's a confirmation. As your shame, as your guilt begins to vanish, that means you are no longer calling yourself that brute who treated that woman like no man should treat a dog. And yet, we did, didn't we? Girls, boys. All right. But that was, that was a maniac. And, and the maniac was there, no question. A person who behaves like a maniac is a maniac. And for a long, long time, we tried to get rid of that raving maniac. And every time we did, he'd come back again the next day, the next week, until we thought he would kill us. And he was killing us, wasn't he? The very, his very presence was killing us in relationship to eternity and real goodness. Then something happened. That something, that something was something in us that wasn't pure by any means and, and even its desperation had wrong desperation in it and yet the, there was this questioning where you looked and saw all those witch doctors in the African village and you knew you were looking at insane people who were teaching you how to live but you didn't open your mouth did you you were too afraid to you were even afraid of their revenge because you, you knew they were as insane as you were, but you climbed four or five steps up that small hill, then another ten steps, and you looked down, and, and your suspicion began to grow, began to grow to a certainty that this is insanity. <clears throat> and, and this is the beginning of the long, long, long journey from the heart of that dark, dark jungle with that village in it, with all your relatives and friends. Plunging into that jungle all alone, it's pretty scary. Right. And the, the reason it's scary, you don't know it. You won't know till you're out of the jungle that you yourself even created the jungle that you had to walk out of. Because the jungle was also in here. And we're using a figure of speech too, of course. The jungle can disappear while you're right in the middle of it. You're right in the middle of the jungle. All around for a thousand miles, this thick greenery with the strange animals and all that. If you suddenly became, suddenly woke up, the jungle would disappear. And all around you would be something different, something very pretty, something in which there were no menacing animals at all. Vernon, Lila has a tremendous fear of not belonging to any group or organization or other human being. Say that again, I'm sorry. Lila has a tremendous fear of not belonging to any group or organization or other human being. You have a fear of not belonging to any? You should have a fear of belonging. Of being by, alone, I guess. Well, who's alone? Ideas that want to associate with other ideas so that they can feel that they are right? This is what every psycho organization does. Every organization does. Sickies coming together so they can call themselves sane. And you want to belong to an organization? What, what do you want most, Lila? Comfort of being with someone or to be an, a person who has everlasting life? I know what one is. The other, I have no idea what it is. Let me tell you something. Now, Lila, you listen to me. 
Now I'm telling you the truth. I don't lie to you, you understand? All of you, your tears have no value. Your crying, your yearning to belong to this group or to get this or that. Your yearning has no value. Now, Lila, you can listen to me or you can listen to yourself. And you can follow what I say or you can follow what your old nature says. Which do you want? I know it's a deliberate question. Let's see what happens. Let's see what you do with that. Which do you want? What I tell you which is the truth? Or do you want to follow Lila who is tormenting herself all day long? Which do you want? I would like truth. My mind tells me. But it, I don't know what that is. All right, all right. Is there, a, is there just a bit of you that wants to change? Mm -hmm. huh. Lila and the rest of you, you can't change as long as you don't understand that all your thoughts are directed toward Lila Guy Gordon. You can't change until you understand by seeing it for yourself. Walk down any street tomorrow. Watch the thoughts that come to your mind. I want that suit in the window. I want that pretty girl coming down the street to smile at me. I want to get home fast so I don't miss the latest TV program. I, w I, want, to, I want to be accepted by people, on and on. Every time you start the sentence with I, you're in trouble already, no matter what you fill it in with. Because you're talking about something, someone, who doesn't exist at all. But that's why you do it. You want to keep the delusion going that you are you. Because you, you are all you have ever known. How's that for bad company? <laughs> you can have much better company inwardly. And that will change your company outwardly too. You're such, you're such miserable little slaves of your friends and of your relatives. You don't have to be, you don't have to be accepted by anyone. You don't have to be desired by anyone. You don't have to be pursued by anyone. Who knows more about you and about running this universe, you or God? Now come on. See, you can't get out of that. You'll try, but you can't really. No way you can really get out of that. There it is, right in front of you. Who knows most? Your mind, the way it now thinks, or truth itself? Who is the smartest, you or truth? Now, you can answer that question, because if you're miserable, then you've said that you are smarter than God. God is not competing with you at all. 